You're listening to Navigating the French on Paris Underground Radio. Hello, and welcome to Navigating the French, the podcast where each episode we look at a French word and try and see what it tells us about French culture. I'm your host, Emily Monaco. Today, I'm chatting with creative professional and wearer of many hats, Aunt Dittmeyer. She's here to talk about a word that may have French origins, but that remains foreign to many French people. Entrepreneur. All right. Welcome, Anne. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. Um, can you tell our listeners a little bit about who you are and what you do here in France? Well, thanks so much for having me. I am happy to be here. I am an American uh, designer turned creative coach and workshop facilitator. I came to Paris in 2009 for a master's in global communications, started my own business, never left, and became French about six years ago now. Wow, that is quite the journey. And as a fellow American, I'm sure that you know, um, and a fellow entrepreneur as well, which is the word we're here to discuss today, I'm sure you know that George Bush famously once claimed that the French don't have a word for entrepreneur. Now, obviously, that made a lot of people laugh at the time because entrepreneur is a French word, but it does have a slightly different meaning in French and the connotations of being an entrepreneur here are super different. So I'm really excited to discuss that with you today. So in French, and please feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, entrepreneur literally at its source means one who undertakes and not an undertaker, but someone who, you know, commits to doing something. Is that right? Um, <laughs> I, I trust you on the linguistic side <laughs> okay. of things. Um, but yeah, it's taking charge and doing your own thing. And I think for me, that's not the natural way of doing things in France. And so in many ways, I do agree with George Bush on this one, and maybe only thing. <laughs> because things are done a certain way here. And it's like, say comme ça, this is how it is. So it's not just doing something or doing something differently. Like it's more involved because you almost have to like override these societal ways of doing things and this programming of, no, you have to go to this school and then do this and then this. So yeah, I feel like entrepreneurial ways of doing things are, are not the natural or obvious way of doing things in France. Yeah. Like, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that in your experience you've had, you know, similar moments of like, I have, I, so I'm also an entrepreneur. I was a salaried employee here in France and you have a really awesome post. I'm going to include a link in the description to the podcast about sort of all of the different work statuses that you can have in France, because that's a super important element of working here in France. And I used to be a salaried uh, status and I was transitioning to a self-employed or entrepreneur status. And how many times I have cried in a bureaucratic office just openly is so because it's it's just so counter cultural to want to be an entrepreneur to want to be self employed. What was sort of your perception when you were getting started here in France about just the cultural response to saying I'm self employed or you know did people think you were unemployed? Did they think that they think you were crazy? I mean, how were how what were the reactions like? There was a lot of judgment, a lot of not understanding, a lot of like, oh, because you can't get a real job <laughs> mm. was the vibe I was getting from people, particularly of older generations. You know, being self-employed is another kiss of death, uh, as if getting an apartment in Paris and France is not hard enough as is. Not having that, you know, steady paycheck is also something that is kind of a little bit frowned upon. So it... I think we're going to talk more about the shifts and things. But for me, I, I've realized lately how important it was for me that early on, three of my first French friends, and then I had one other friend who was British, were all self-employed. So they kind of showed me what was possible and they enjoyed their lives and were doing really interesting things that were for far more fulfilling. In my own journey, You know, I, I came as a student, I realized as I was a student, I enjoyed having this freedom and flexibility of setting my own schedule. I had hated being at a chained to a desk from 8.30 to 5.30 every day in the US. And so I transitioned from being a student to uh, being auto entrepreneur, my first business status. And I didn't realize that in being auto entrepreneur, I wasn't allowed to teach for a university. And there's so many different layers that can go into the, the bureaucracy where it's quite complicated. But long story short, 
I had all these limitations that I didn't know. And so it just forced me to be more creative. So I like to look at things in terms of creative constraints. So all these annoyances and frustrations are what I channeled into, into my business and doing things differently and just plowing forward, even though there was a lot of skepticism, a lot of judgment, a lot of not understanding. And on top of it, the French tend to do one thing. They decide in college, in middle school, which track they're going to take. And that's what they're on. And so I was a slasher when I was starting out in slashes, where I was a writer, I was a designer, my my background's in graphic design. And I was giving tours of Paris at the time. And so the fact that I had multiple jobs just confused people to no end. So it's a whole combination of different things that don't fit the mold of French society. Totally. And I love this sort of optimism you have in the face of those creative constraints. I do feel like, um, you know, I was a literature student, which I, so I'm totally understanding this like one track mind the French have. I bounced, I mean, I was a, I changed my college major four different times. I have had, you know, so many hats. I am also a slashes. So in my entrepreneur status, like there's no real bucket that my job can live in. I think you have the same kind of yes. problem where like I'm a tour guide, but I'm also a journalist. I'm also a podcaster. And sometimes I teach English and, you know, they they don't like that very much. Um, but this idea of creative constraints is super interesting to me because I feel like when in my literature degree, we learned about this French literary movement called the Ulipo where they were famous for setting constraints for themselves to increase their creativity. And so the they specifically, there was a, a writer called Georges Perec who wrote this book called La Disparition, which is written entirely without the letter E, which is the most common letter in <laughs> French. And it's like how to make things really difficult for yourself and see what creative solutions come out of that constraint. So I think you've taken the constraints of France and created something very creative. Wow. How many times can I use the word creative in one <laughs> sentence? But let's back up a little bit because you mentioned a couple of really interesting pieces of this puzzle that I think are almost kind of flabbergasting when you first get here. So first off, you were talking a little bit about how as a self-employed person, there is a, a difficulty in trying to do something as simple as get an apartment. Can you tell me a little bit about why your work status has, and, and not necessarily your income, has such an important effect on your ability to be part of French society in so many different ways? Because French society is based on documents and what you have versus anything that's actually practical or how people live. Um, <laughs> Preach. It's just, you know, things are old school. There are all these protections, but my background is also in UX design, user experience, and user research. And so it's looking at different behaviors and habits and things that we say versus the actual situation. So they want you to have to earn three to four times the the monthly rent. At least this is how it was years ago. But almost nobody can do that. But then they finally let you into the place and it's almost impossible to kick somebody out of an apartment. So it's, it's the kicking people out. So they want to make sure they get the right people in. I think it's all backwards because honestly, I'm more likely to pay my rent than a French person because I had a neighbor once who didn't. And she was ironically <laughs> studying law and moved out secretly in the middle of the night. But it's just these processes that have always been a certain way. And so they continue this way. And it, it's almost the safety net. I can't even explain it. It is. It's the way it is. Say comme ça. Like you don't question it, but at the same time, you can find a landlord who, you know, is entrepreneurial themselves. Or for me, it was always helpful to have a landlord who had a child or a relative who had spent time in the U.S. and they were suddenly more empathetic uh, to my situation. But it's formal procedures, but even friends with, you know, one of the couple has a very steady job, good salary. The other one might be intermittent, which is an intermediary status, like working for the cinema. You're not working on a movie every day, all day for a year. So it, it applies to other people too, not just entrepreneurs. But yeah, it's a country of documents and formalities. Okay. So you basically have like multiple statuses and you've evoked a couple of them. So you have this Intermittent, which is generally for, as you said, like cinema or artists, you have business owners, and then you have this salarié status, which is most I, probably, I mean, 
most French people would be a salarié, which means they would have either a CDD, so a short uh, contract that will be that'll last for six months and can be renewed, or a CDI, which is this like unfireable job, right? It's this like once you have a CDI, you're kind of golden in French society, and I and as opposed to having like credit, which you like, you'd show your credit score if you were renting an apartment in the U.S. For example, in France, you don't have credit. Most people don't have a credit card; they have a debit card. But they do have this CDI, and the the paper proving that you have a CDI is kind of the open sesame paper to get you a lot of what you need. Yeah, golden ticket. Yeah, the golden ticket. Now uh, you're an an entrepreneur, but you did also evoke this status or this job, you know, category called the auto-entrepreneur, which auto, A-U-T-O, so self-entrepreneur, self-employed. Can you tell me a little bit about that status? Have you ever held that status? Yes. So that's what I started after I was a student, making that transition from student to to auto-entrepreneur. I'm not sure if that's possible anymore. I'm not sure if it's possible. But auto-entrepreneur was created as a secondary status for French people because historically, according to Jean Teke, who is an expert who works with expats often, you know, historically, if you worked for a bank, you or anywhere else, but just as one role, you weren't allowed to have another job or other income because that would be taking away from the work you were doing <laughs> at your okay. current job. So a uh, auto entrepreneur status, the example you'd given me was, you know, you work at a bank, but you're a Harley Davidson motorcycle fanatic and like to repair motorcycles on weekends, but for pay. So the auto entrepreneur was the secondary status that allowed you to have two jobs because God forbid we make any money (laughs) in this country. So it was that, but then it kind of evolved. And so a stylist friend, that was her status when she started. And so I just did what I saw other people doing. I was not making a lot of money out of grad school. I did not, I was never educated in how to run a business. So much was learning the hard way. So the problem was as an expat, I had a working status because you need, with auto entrepreneur, any entrepreneurial status, you get a sire number or siret, I think you pronounce the T, and you have to have that number to freelance. But working status does not give you residency status. So, as an American in France, you know, I had the right to freelance, but I didn't have the working. Right. So I had, after I finished my master's thesis, I wrote a 50 page business plan in French, did all this work, but it was collecting all the random documents was harder than writing a business plan. And I was naive and thought I would get a three year carte de séjour, which is the residency visa. And instead, I learned that I had to renew every three months, which was living hell, especially when my landlords would not give me a rent receipt because they did not declare their apartment. Oh my God. So it was this big rigmarole going around in circles. Um, I also learned that I, the one thing I wanted to do was teach in a university, not full-time, but from time to time. But universities stopped accepting teachers under auto entrepreneur status because that was a status that universities were using to not escape paying taxes, but they weren't getting the same taxes. So the state actually said, oh, no, universities, like you have to give somebody a CD, CDD, the temporary status, or invoice a different way. But there were all these different things. So I had all these limitations and it was living hell. And I was like, I could be contributing to the economy and making more money, but instead I'm hitting my head against the wall and trying to find papers and understand the system that nobody really understands. And c'est comme ça. It's, it's, that's how it is. So shortly after that, um, I pivoted to professionnel, li, pres, profession, I can't even say it, profession liberal. So it's the same thing. Auto entrepreneur, you don't have business expenses. Professional liberal, I do. It made it just easier to renew. I had to renew every year until I became French. And I actually became French before I was able to get a 10 year card just because of different processes. Okay. So. Awesome. I mean, awesome. <laughs> a long story. Awesome, awesome that you've gotten there. Um, sounds like hell to go through. If you're enjoying this episode of Navigating the French, you may also be interested in our sister podcast, The Terroir Podcast. 
co-hosted by me, Emily, and Caroline Connor of Wine Dine Caroline. Each week, we take a deep dive into the food, wine, and more of a different region in France. Navigating the French will be right back after a word from our sponsors. And now, back to Navigating the French. And I think, yeah, like Auto Entrepreneur is supposed to be a little bit easier. You get a little bit less red tape. They guess how much VAT you're earning and then sort of have you contribute a, a, a fraction of your of your income rather than actually having you do the work that you have to do, which is like to actually keep track of where all your money is coming from and which VAT you're paying and which VAT you're collecting and then doing all of that at the end. And you do also have to pay social charges. Can you tell me a little bit about the social <laughs> charges system? <laughs> oh, God. So VAT, I call it TVA. Uh, just so you know, under my status is 20%. Uh, when I have clients in the US, they're exempt. It depends on the place. So URSAF is where I pay my social charges. They take the largest portion of my money and it's a lot. And I also laughed just then because I'm currently trying to resolve an issue from 2011. Yes, you heard that right. <laughs> that appeared in my account about two years ago saying that I did not declare, I don't know, my taxes or something in 2011. That was the year I started my business. I did not make any money. And so I wrote this attestation sur l'honneur honorary declaration that I mailed to them by lettre recommande, so certified mail, and sent it to them in April. Um, we are recording this in January. And so the, for me, this is just a symbol of how things work. I always like to think that the more money you pay to a certain organization, the more efficient they are and helpful for you. Not always the case. So we do a lot more online now than when I started my business. So my general policy was to always go in person because my French, I'm fluent, but this is a whole language that when you, you don't know what you don't know. And also nobody volunteers information in France across the board, not just in business. But so you're dealing with this messagerie, these messages and back and forth and different declarations. So another little side note is that they decided during the pandemic to pause all of the social charges. So I pay upwards of like 700 euros a month to, to this, this association or group for my social charges. And during the pandemic, they took it upon themselves to pause all of these automatic charges, which sounds nice if they were just going to let them go. But they decided as a group that they were going to, quote, help people out by pausing this, not realizing that for some people, business actually turned better. I started doing workshops online. You know, the pandemic, ironically, that creative constraints of not being able to go anywhere pushed me more in the direction I was trying to go. So Ursaf paused all of these social charges. They didn't let you opt in or opt out. I had to call them to have it started again. Then when I started it, started going, on the phone, they never bothered to mention, oh, what about all those charges from 2020? And so then I had, you know, five or 7,000 euros that I needed to pay out of pocket. So that's the scary thing in business. There are all these organizations that talk to each other and they say they talk to each other, but then it's a surprise regularization, this like regularization, <laughs> I don't even know the word in English, just to regulate <laughs> those charges. And then in order to make those charges, just to bring the story full circle, she's like, oh, yes, you can do a Viermont, which is a wire transfer. But she said, oh, you need to do eight separate Viermont, eight separate transfers for each of these different <laughs> payments because it couldn't be a lump sum for tracking it. So that's just a little bit of a symbol of how things can work in France, not necessarily the most efficient. And I had to be extremely proactive in getting that to happen. But anyway, healthcare is very affordable in France. I went to the emergency room once and it was seven euros. So it all balances out, but <laughs> it is a test of sanity. And even 10 years into my business, I find these roadblocks and I'm in this several month long roadblock of trying to undo these things that were communicated to me, not clearly and through very formal bureaucratic language. Wow. And yeah, I mean, that 
forgiveness, that kindness in major scare quotes of like the the pausing of the Ursaf payments absolutely destroyed me last year. Like I was telling, I was basically just like, please just take all my money. No, it's fine. Anything. I just, yeah. But I think one thing that you've shown through your story is this other sort of meaning of the word entrepreneur in French, which is not used that often to describe someone who owns their own business unless they have that auto-entrepreneur status. What's used instead is the borrowed French word, which is freelance. Like people say, oh, oui, je suis en freelance. Or for in my um, work as a freelance writer, we say, je suis pigiste. So like I do like pige is like one freelance job, but it's a specific, usually a specific journalism word. The word entrepreneur in French I've found is often used instead of as a noun, as an adjective to describe someone's personality. So Anne est très entrepreneuse. Anne sort of takes things upon herself and does the things she needs to do to get the job done, including calling the URSAF 15 times or going down to the office or collecting all of those papers. Do you find that, you know, that that characteristic of being entrepreneurs is something that is valued or sought after in French society? Well, first of all, when you started your business and then today, because I think that the evolution of entrepreneurialness has evolved quite a bit since you first started your business. And I'd love to talk to you about that. So I asked you two questions. First off, do you think that that value is it, that that idea, that characteristic is valued in French society of being entrepreneurial? Yeah, I think it's appreciated. I think it's often appreciated in hindsight, more than at the time. Because I mean, I remember being at parties and I hated introducing myself to French people because I didn't know them. And so I didn't know at what entry point to explain, like, do you even know what design is or do you know what UX is? And so some of it was, you know, me getting in my own way. But so over the years, I've had to learn just to own who I am, own what I do, own that I do things differently. And, you know, I have French clients who prefer to work with me in English just because I bring this different perspective and it's very refreshing. And a lot of companies will bring me in to have that more Anglophone perspective, even if I'm doing something in French. So I think, you know, that's still linking it to my Anglophone side, but I think that they do appreciate it. They might not understand it, especially in the beginning, but I do see it that over time it has evolved and become more normalized and more people quitting their typical salaried jobs in order to try to do something different. And what's been most interesting is seeing people pivot careers, because I used to tell French friends about my friend in the US who was a nurse and then decided to go to law school. And here they're like, oh, c'est pas possible, you can't do that. <laughs> and I'm like, but in America, you can. And so that's such a cliche, but it's so much is about mindset. And in my own business and how I show up for it, I realize that I'm having to undo all of these beliefs and limits and ceilings that people have put on me in terms of what's possible. Because all my grad school professors told me, oh, you can't stay in France. Nobody told me I could. I just had to do it. But it's been really inspiring seeing other French people pivot careers completely and go into doing um, their own thing or doing things, you know, differently than they had done before instead of just a continuation of their past experience into their own version, but really adding their own twist to it more. Yeah, absolutely. And the, I mean, I think that there's part, part of it comes from people wanting to do that more. And part of it comes from the easing of some of those really, really strict regulations that used to make it almost impossible to, to switch. I mean, it's gone from impossible to almost impossible to switch industries. Um, but one thing that I found really interesting when uh, Emmanuel Macron, who's our current president, was the minister of economy, he actually pushed through a law that made it a lot easier for me to do my job. So in, in my experience, when I was a tour guide, if you wanted to offer guided tours of Paris, you had to have a license to do so, especially if you wanted to guide within museums. And to get that license, you had to get a degree in guiding. And any any experience that you had on the ground was kind of moot. So you had all these people graduating from guiding school 
who were coming on to be tour guides who had no guiding experience versus someone like me who had been guiding as a second job during my university degree, who had the knowledge and had the experience, but it was impossible for me to get that license. And Macron decided that instead of forcing people like me to go back to school, you could write a letter and prove with, you know, lots and lots of evidence and paperwork and shenanigans that you had the on the ground experience required to do the job just as well as someone who had been to school for it. And so by, you know, loosening some of those regulations and constraints and not forcing people to go back to school necessarily to do a job they knew how to do or allowing them to go back and do, you know, a practical exam in six months rather than a three-year degree, he actually made it a lot easier for people to, um, to change careers. And I think that that was, you know, he was Minister of Economy from 2014 to 2016. I think that we're seeing then and now a lot of changes in sort of the perception of what it is to be an entrepreneur or a self-employed person. So in your experience from the beginning of when you were doing it, I know you talked a bit about sort of the um, the perception of what you do and people being more okay with it, but is there anything else that you've seen evolving and are you are you sort of optimistic about the future of being an entrepreneur in France? Well, yeah, I think even with auto entrepreneur status, it's less of that secondary status and now it is a, a status that many of my friends hold. There is a salary cap with that one, and it is kind of paying into one one entity, and they distribute. And then, Professor Liberal, even with me, it's getting connected. It's getting connected to the health things online. So, yeah, I think things are, yeah, definitely evolving in a good way. Some of it. I keep going back to just like understanding because I was giving tours. I was never certified, but under auto entrepreneur, you have to define your activity to activité. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so mine was design and communication. And so I have to pick two words, but picking a term that is the umbrella for everything you do is really complicated. So I, I think that's evolved. You know, I say I have a portfolio career, which is kind of if you think of a, a financial portfolio where I have different income streams. And so in the French typical mentality, it's like they think, oh, you need a steady full time job to make money. But even when I started my business years ago, I realized that I could make more money doing my own thing than having a low paying job with, you know, so many more limits. So, yeah, I think it's all evolved. I think for me, it's realizing that France is always going to have less frustrations and limits and doing my best within them and just continue to get creative because I know that I would not be doing the work I'm doing today had it not been for all this pain in the ass <laughs> um, bureaucracy that I've had to go through. You know, I started doing work with Skillshare, teaching online classes, a US-based startup. Viable is who I start, first was giving tours through when I was giving tours. And so some of it's also like trusting ourselves. And when somebody says no, like just keep asking questions and figuring out a way and talking to other entrepreneurs to figure out how they do it. I've always been very legit in how I approach everything, but it doesn't mean it's not frustrating. But I do think that things are headed in the right direction, especially for people in tech. France teach, takes it very seriously. There's more tech visas. I think it's a bit of a shame because sometimes I think it's smoke and mirrors. I say a lot in tech is copie coulé. It's copied and paste from a lot in the Anglophone world. And I think we tend to value tech because it's cool and new. But I think there's still a lot more evolution that can happen just in general evolution. And we're seeing, um, you know, how work from home and the pandemic and especially for parents and working parents and childcare how these typical ways of working aren't necessarily sustainable. So France has a lot in place in terms of support, but I think there's still a lot more that could happen as we continue to evolve in how we work. If you're enjoying this episode of Navigating the French, you may also be interested in our sister podcast, Storytime in Paris, where each week host Jennifer interviews a different author about his or her book set in Paris or France. Navigating the French will be right back after a word from our sponsors. And now back to Navigating the French. And you gave, I mean, some really amazing advice to for anyone sort of looking to have a more entrepreneurial career in France. 
Do you have any other sort of concrete tips of things like groups or uh, I mean, I know you mentioned Jean Teke, who's kind of the expat guru for all things bureaucracy. Is there anything else that you found to be particularly useful in terms of just adapting to being an entrepreneur specifically in France? I've tried to share what I've learned on my blog, Prêt de Voyager, but I also always say that my experiences, things have evolved and changed. So I recommend trying to find other people who are doing similar things or in a similar phase because I don't want to be giving somebody old information. I also come with it with a lot of baggage, which I've <laughs> I've worked on. Like I've had to honestly, consciously learn on letting that go because I was holding myself back because of all these stories that France had taught me. But I was just like, oh no, just keep going. So and knowing that there are different statuses. So my friend who's a pastry chef, like you have to have CAPE, you know, which is a, a specific pastry certification here. And there's an even another certification for chocolate. I have a friend who Maison des Artistes is another status. So it would, as a designer, it seemed like Maison des Artistes would be the status, but I was not doing commercial work per se, but I wasn't doing art for art's sake. So I have a friend who had like one status, who when she was doing illustration, but when she went to sell poupé little stuffed dolls that looked like her, her illustrations, she had to st start a secondary business status in order to do that. So things have changed. My main advice for anybody is to ask questions, ask more questions, ask dumb questions, ask, should I, is there anything else I should be asking? And I know it doesn't happen as much um, but Ursaf, like going in person or, I mean, I've been here 12 years. I had to have a pull in a French friend recently to help me craft these messages and emails and to understand. And, you, you know, I, as a foreigner, I can think like, this French doesn't really make sense. And then she looks at it as a French person. She's like, that, that text is horrible. So <laughs> the UX designer in me just cringes because I see all this possibility for making processes efficient and communicating information. And, you know, my broken Ursaf account at this point, you know, there should be something in the system that flags it. But you have to be proactive. You have to get comfortable with it. And the other big business tip is to hire an accountant. It is the best money you will save like spend like I found one that they believe in technology so the software does it all but don't be stubborn go to the professionals keep asking questions and kind of I think triangulation is really key to getting different perspectives and don't expect don't just take one answer as full truth because <laughs> it's hard for me to tell my story if you haven't noticed because so much is interlinked and a domino so trying to understand the entire you know, universe around working in France helps a lot too. That is some amazing advice. Um, and I've so appreciated your perspective on this word and its evolution here in France. Um, I just have one more question for you before we go. And that is, what is your favorite word in French? I'm going to go with Kinkairi. <laughs> Am I saying that right? Yeah. I love it that word. It took me so long to say. And I like, I don't even know <laughs> the proper word in English that's. It's like hardware store? Kind of. But it's like a five and dime store, like yeah. mismatch. You know, we have so many beautiful boutiques in Paris, but just these stores that have all the random crap that you might need and you ask them. And it's, but there's on, one on Rue Montegroy where it's written above it. And it's just like, Kyrie. And I, if you, if this was a spelling bee, I would fail. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's like a couple of silent L's and yeah, but it's a beautiful word. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Learn, learning to pronounce something is always fun. So. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me, Anne. Thanks for having me, Emily. This has been Navigating the French. You can find more from me, Emily Monaco at Emily underscore in underscore France on Twitter and Instagram. This podcast is produced by Paris Underground Radio. To listen to other episodes of this podcast or to discover more podcasts like it, please visit parisundergroundradio.com. Thanks for listening and à bientôt. This episode of Navigating the French was produced by Jennifer Garrity for Paris Underground Radio. For more on this show and shows like it, please visit parisundergroundradio.com.